For those of you who only watched the first few seconds of a video, here's your answer over a billion dollars, and that's a, a pretty conservative estimate. There you go, you're sorted, you can head off if you like. For those of you who like to uh, find out how I came to this demonstrably big number and all of the steps that will kind of be in the way from creating a CPU, then uh, feel free to stick around. This is something that I can't find anyone else who's put all this information into one piece of content before, and I spent a good 50 hours writing, researching, editing, and uh, filming, all that jazz to make this video. So I really do hope you enjoy it, find it useful, and please do share it if you, uh, if you did. Licensing would be your first major hurdle. I've explained this in much greater detail in my Why Intel and AMD Have No competition video that's coming out in a week's time, Wednesday 8pm GMT, so feel free to go check that one out. I'll leave a uh, link uh, in the description as well as a card up above. Uh, but basically, Intel created the x86 architecture and owns uh, all the patents to it, and AMD created the 64-bit instruction set, which means uh, you would actually need to go and get an agreement from both Intel and AMD to use the instruction set to create your shiny new multi-core CPU. There are a couple ways you could go about this. You could obviously go directly to Intel and AMD and make uh, try and make agreements with them. This is likely either going to be impossible or in the hundreds of millions of dollars, or you could also go the sort of profit share route with that, sort of teaming up with either VIA or IBM or someone else who holds an x86 uh, licensing agreement so that uh, they, you have to give them a percentage of your profits per uh, chip you sell, but uh, you will obviously not be sued by Intel and AMD. So there's kind of a, a balance to it, but either way it's going to be either a very long term or very short term, but still very large cost up front. CPU design is the next hurdle. A company called Transmeta started in 1996 with $288 million and was able to design a relatively high power, for the time anyway, CPU called Crusoe, which is similar to Intel's performance again at the time and can, didn't actually run x86 instructions. The way it worked, which is actually very similar to Intel's processors, is that it had its own uh, sort of proprietary VLIW or very long instruction word processing unit or engine inside the chip and then it had a decoder, a, a, a software layer, translation layer that would convert the x86 instructions into its own instruction set and then it would uh, do that sort of operation. Interestingly, Intel actually does this exact thing, although the way they do it is actually use a RISC or reduced instruction set computing architecture inside the chip with then a uh, hardware sort of translator that will uh, decode the instructions as it comes in, which is actually really interesting and means that it can be in theory more efficient while still producing x86 instructions. The problem with the transmitter chip is that since it was developed in the year 2000, it's still very, very outdated. The performance that you can get from it is nowhere near the performance that you can get from existing Intel and even potentially Ryzen CPUs when they do come out. So you would likely need about $300 million to be able to design a brand new chip with your own architecture that actually would be able to in any way rival Intel or AMD. This PDF, which is part of the computer science course at Princeton University, gives you an idea of how to create a pretty basic CPU that would carry out a total of 16 instructions. To give you a comparison, the x86-64 instruction set arguably totals 2034 instructions, so a fair bit more. In the PDF, a series of logic gates are used to store and compute data. In this case, the register is comprised of two NOR gates, or not OR gates, so when S or SET is set high, the first gate's output goes low, and since RESET is low until you want it to RESET the bit, Q would go high. The feedback would keep the outputs of the first gate high until power is lost or until reset goes high, and then Q would go low. I took A-level electronics, so this is stuff I understand, but I highly recommend you looking up uh, logic gates, transistors, capacitors, resistors, uh, and all that sort of stuff, and also Boolean algebra if you want to know more detail on how your computer works at a relatively basic level. CPU design is a bit of a black horse. For example, this is Intel's 4004 circuit diagram. It's pretty massive, has 2,300 transistors, and was made on the 10 micrometer feature size, which, to give you context, is about a thousand times per transistor bigger than Intel's next generation uh, Canon Lake CPUs, which are going to be 10 nanometers. You could, and probably should for prototyping anyway, manufacture your chip and an FPGA, which is a field programmable gate array, which is basically a completely you know changeable uh, chip. But the problem with that is that they're really not that efficient, and also the amount of transistors that you would want to include in one of these chips might not necessarily be entirely possible in an FPGA, and even if it is, it wouldn't be that efficient in heat or power. 
server. Once you've designed your CPU, you'll either need to make it work with existing Intel or AMD motherboards and chipsets, or you'll need to manufacture your own. VIA, a Taiwanese company, did just that. They're currently making relatively low power x86 CPUs that uh, do sort of general uh, sort of embedded uh, installation type stuff. It can't, the, those CPUs and those uh, PCs that they provide can run Windows. They can also run x86 Linux, and it's a very simple, fairly low power operation. They do produce quad cores, which is quite nice, but nothing on the realm of what Intel and AMD do on the high end. If you did want to make your own chipset, another problem you might face is getting motherboard manufacturers to want to, you know, put that chipset on motherboards and also designing and manufacturing motherboards to actually work with your chip. Of course, if you design your own chipset, you'll also need to make sure that it works with PCIe, SATA, USB, and all the other sort of peripherals that you could want. And of course, you'll also have to get licensing agreements from all of those companies, especially if you want to use something like Thunderbolt, which is an Intel technology. So you might need another licensing agreement from Intel just to use that one. You'll also likely need another 200 million for software development. Now this is software to actually have your chip run to make it work. The translation layer, if you do a the, the way that Intel, I believe AMD and uh, Transmeta and a lot of other people who've manufactured CPUs uh, the way they do stuff. So uh, you will need a fairly hefty software team. This is something that the sources were quite light on information on. So if you have any you know, uh, experience or uh, you know, expertise in this field, please do let me know down below as I'd love to hear from you. After you've done that and spent a good seven to eight hundred million dollars, you're likely going to need another one to two hundred million dollars at least for verification of the chip. You need to make sure that no matter what instruction is sent to the chip, any one of the 2034, give or take, uh, instructions in that instruction set, no matter what one of those instructions is sent with no matter what uh, you know data is sent along with it, you will always get the expected result. This will be fairly easy on the Intel 4004 with only 2300 transistors and a relatively limited instruction set, but when you're talking about Intel's current generation Kaby Lake CPUs with 1.75 billion transistors and a, a very large 2034 instruction set. Uh, you're, you're starting to get a little bit more complicated. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of effort. And of course, you then have to go back and make changes to your software and to your CPU design if anything doesn't work. So assuming you've managed to get it right the first time or maybe you've just gone back and done it again and spent another two, three, four hundred million dollars, uh, then uh, you've and you've also managed to navigate the litigation storm that would likely ensue with architecture designs, instruction sets, and all that sort of stuff, then you have to deal with actually manufacturing it. Now you can manufacture the chips yourself, that's a very complicated, painful, potentially dangerous if you don't know what you're doing process, and that's likely gonna be in the order of one to 10 billion dollars extra, so uh, you may not necessarily want to do that. I've left a full list of uh, these steps of how to manufacture that in the Wikipedia link down below, so feel free to check that one out. Now if you don't fancy manufacturing it yourself, you can get someone like Global Foundries, who's AMD's fabricator, or someone like TSMC, Taiwanese Semiconductor Corp, to manufacture it for you. This is likely going to cost you five to ten million dollars of an upfront cost just to get them to work with you, and then obviously a cost per unit, or at the very least a cost per wafer, plus a packaging cost to get it into a sort of final state where you can actually uh, you know sell it and have people put it into motherboards and that sort of thing. Then of course there's a whole mess of money, likely somewhere between one to two hundred million dollars as well that you need to spend on marketing alone. You of course also want to set up a logistics system and also get your chips into people like Dell's PCs. That would be a very big client for you, but otherwise congrats, you have a very, very simplified understanding of how to manufacture a CPU. To make it clear, this is a gross simplification of the process and the details. I'm not an engineer in the field. I have no experience working for Intel, AMD, VIA, Transmeter, or any of the other companies. Uh, and I, I'm sort of just a, a researcher looking at the stuff as opposed to someone who actually has uh, a detailed understanding. Of course, I do relatively understand the logic gates and that sort of thing, but there's still uh, a massive black hole of information. So if you have any information uh, on this topic, uh, you know, actually manufacturing CPUs or uh, CPU design or anything else, please do let me know in the comments down below. This video has all been all about learning, both on my part and you guys. And it's been awesome to research this, get a bit of an understanding for stuff, and be able to share it with you guys so that uh, kind of everyone in the world gets a little bit smarter. And of course, it's been awesome making something that I can't find anywhere else on the internet. So that's pretty cool too. 
Otherwise, uh, if you enjoyed the video, please do share it. It's uh, been a massive amount of work to, to get to this point, a massive amount of filming, a massive amount of researching especially, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So as I said, please do share it with anyone you think will be interested in it. And of course, if you did like it, feel free to like and subscribe as well, and let me know in the comments down below, and all that sort of stuff. If you're buying anything, please do use Overclockers UK or Amazon affiliates. The Amazon ones are worldwide. And the Overcox UK is obviously for OC UK, but uh, please do use those more general links for anything you're buying. It genuinely does help me out and keeps the lights on and uh, keeps the uh, actually keeps me getting new things like the LED lights that I'm currently using that are actually really awesome and means that I can film uh, and make better videos uh, and all that sort of stuff. So please do use those. Otherwise, as I said, subscribe, check out some of the other videos. Do stick around for the video next week. It's in a week's time from now, Wednesday, 8 p.m. GMT, as per you know usual videos. So. Uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of that really. Hope you enjoyed the video, found it useful. As I said, please do share it if you can, and we'll see you all in the next one.